Um, so I'm going to um, fly through what we've already talked about in uh, this uh, story of the woman at the well. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, Jesus is, is leaving Jerusalem. Uh, he's going to Galilee. Uh, the, the curriculum, or not the curriculum, the Bible tells us that much. Um, and we talked about the people of Sakar. There's the picture of Sakar. You can see it there, right between um, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. I'm not, not sure which is which. Uh, and we talked about the people um, of, of uh, Samaria. And uh, I'm just going to real quickly remind you of this, because as I told you yesterday, you will have a, an essay on this, and you're going to need to know this. That King Sargon of Assyria came and defeated um, at least Samaria, maybe Israel as well. Well, not just Samaria, because never mind. Uh, and um, he, took, um, he took some people... Uh, the, the most more important people, men, men uh, probably uh, mostly uh, leaders, that sort of thing, and took them captive. Uh, and he left his army behind. He left people to rule um, Israel. Uh, and did God did God say uh, to his people that they should not intermarry with foreign peoples? Yes, he most definitely did say that. Why? Why? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, God knew that if his people intermarried with pagan uh, countries, with people from pagan countries, their people would be drawn away from him. They would be drawn into paganism. Did that happen? Absolutely it happened. 100% it happened. Uh, I'm in Ezekiel right now, and it's whoo, it's bad. Um, and uh, it uh, that God was trying to protect His people. Think about when you were little, and uh, in in my house, uh, our our second house, the house that we brought our children home to, um, it was on a. I didn't know until the day we moved in, but it was on a pretty busy street, and it was on a hill, and people would just come flying down that. And we had a fenced-in backyard, and that's the only place my kids could go. Because I knew my boys well enough to know that somebody's going to get wrong. Uh, I wasn't trying to be mean. I wasn't trying to to not let them have fun. I was trying to protect them. Uh, and that's what God was trying to do, was trying to protect his people. And it didn't turn out well for them uh, when, when they did that. So um, they intermarried with Samaritans, which uh, the Assyrians did. Which made them not um, not with the Jews, I should say. They intermarried with the Jews, not because that's what created the Samaritans. Um, and and so now you've got these people that the book calls them half breeds. That's an awful term. These people who are uh, from a, a, a Jewish background and from a pagan background, and, and not only was they were they raised racially mixed, that's not the point. The point is that the pagan uh, part of, of Assyria had an impact on the religion of the Jews. Uh, and so um, the way the Jews viewed the Samaritans were this idea populated uh, by a mixed race with a heathen core. They had some things right in there, and she says, we know when Messiah comes, so make all things right. Oh, she was right about that, right? And he, and then Jesus says, "I am speaking to you, me. I am Messiah." Um, but uh, but they there when we get into the insert, you'll see there are places where their theolo theology was also wanky. What it was partly Jewish, it was partly uh, pagan, uh, and so. Uh, they were looked upon with disgust and disdain. I would say it was the it, the other way around was true as well. The Samaritans looked at the Jews with, uh, with distrust, and disgust, and, and disdain, and they both did like the, the Samaritans um, desecrated or, or tried to destroy the temple, and the Jews did the same to the to the Samaritan temple. So both sides uh, acted badly toward the other. As I told you yesterday, think Arabs and Israelis. 
they're still mistreating each other. They still hate each other. Uh, and I think that's going to stay that way probably until Jesus comes back. Um, and then we have this story of Jesus coming to the well uh, and speaking to this woman. Um, and uh, we talked about how uh, we see Christ's uh, humanity in this. We see uh, that he was weary, he was, he was tired, he was thirsty. He looked like a normal uh, Jewish man. Um, and then we also see uh, his deity. Uh, he, um, uh, he offered her eternal life. Only God can do that. Uh, is this where we're picking up? Oh, really? That's as far as we got yesterday. Okay, excellent. Uh, so, um, so his deity. Um, but whoever drinks of this water, that I will give him, uh, that I will give him, will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water uh, welling up to eternal life. Obviously, he's not talking about H2O here. He's talking about something spiritual. Um, and he is, in fact, offering her eternal life. In him is eternal life. And he is offering her eternal life. Only God can do that. Only someone who is eternal can give, give, give someone each eternity. eternity. Uh, as I've said before, you can't give someone something you don't have. Uh, and so he is claiming to be God when he says, uh, that he off offers eternal life. Um, if he were just a man, he couldn't do that. And then he was omniscient. Um, so Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. You're now living with a man who is not your husband. Uh, and so he knew everything. He, even she admitted it. Come meet a man that knew everything I ever did. Uh, and... Um, and, and only God is omniscient. Uh, so we see his deity in uh, the fact that he knew um, everything about her. And then he claimed deity. Um, I've told you my college professor said he never did. I guess he didn't want to read John uh, 4. Um, and it says in verse 25, The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes... He will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am me and he. Now he says, I am. That's the name of God, right? But he says, I am. And she just has been talking about Messiah. So he's not only claiming deity, he's saying, I'm Messiah. I'm the Messiah that you've heard about. Um, and I think that probably um, really surprised her, maybe, and um, um, maybe made her happy. I don't know how she reacted to it. Um, but she understood what he was saying because she says, could this be the Messiah to the people? Um, so Christ is initiating a change in this world. Um, and, uh, and he's initiating a change in how worship is done. No longer will there be a place that we um, but there will be, there will be a person that we work with, and I will get into that a little bit more uh, as we go through. Um, and then he was sustained with spiritual food. This is what he said to his disciples. To his disciples, he said, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He wasn't talking about real food. He wasn't going to Burger King. Um, he was talking about spiritual food. Uh, food. He was um, um, he was uh, talking about uh, how God um, offers us um, what we need. Like, of course, Jesus ate, but he had supernatural, spiritual understanding um, as well. Uh, and so he's making a change here in how we worship, um, as I said. Um, and then we see his dedication and urgency to God's will. So now we're going to turn, and, and he's going to have um, he's going to have a lesson for his disciples in this. The woman's gone, 
and uh, and he turns and talks to his disciple. He says this, do you not say that there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? So we understand this. We live in Nebraska, right? Every spring, what do we see farmers planting around here? Corn. Every summer and and for feed corn fall, uh, what do they do? They harvest it, right? They harvest it. And, and there's that gap between planting and harvest. And, and But Jesus is going to say spiritually, there's no gap. So, uh, Lord, uh, excuse me, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. And, and white meant that they were blooming and they were ready, that, that whatever it was, was ready to be harvested. Um, so, um, so Jesus is, is teaching his disciples here because he wants them to want to tell others the truth of the gospel. And the same is true for us. He wants us to tell others of the gospel. He wants us to witness to others and to tell others about Jesus. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. There's four months to harvest and uh, then the harvest comes and, and he says, but look, you're, you know, the, the harvest is already here. I think when he says, look, look, lift up your eyes, I think he really means that. Because I think, you know, the woman leaves, she tells the Samaritans, they come to Jesus. I think he says, look, I planted this seed in the, the woman and here comes the harvest already and the people are walking toward me. I can't prove that, but uh, it makes sense. Um, so he wants his disciples to have that same urgency uh, to tell people. And then we see his concern for his disciples. He wants them to grow. He wants them to know the truth. That's why he spent three years teaching. Uh, and he did a really good job. Uh, so do you not say that there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, at, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. They're ready to be... Uh, reaped. Uh, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Um, so uh, here's here's what the, uh, what Jesus did for this this woman, um, and and both sal the idea of salvation and evangelism are prominent in this account. Salvation, of course, means coming to saving a saving knowledge of Jesus. Evangelism is telling other people how they can know Jesus, um, and but we see both of these. So let's look at some. Uh, lessons uh, of about uh, in evangelism. Um, Jesus aroused her curiosity. He made her curious about him, about what he was saying. Um, he was he was very respectful, um, and he was very kind, um, and it, he was winsome. I love that word winsome. Some uh, uh, attractive, not of the sense of somebody's good looking, somebody uh, is that you want to hear more from, somebody that you want to get to know better. Um, and he spoke to her civilly, and he may be the first person in her adult life that was ever kind to her. She was an outcast within a group of outcasts. Think about it. She would keep, they, she was an outcast in a group of outcasts. Um, and he asked her for a favor. Give me a drink. Um, and uh, he humbled himself. Um, and that, to ask for a favor, is to humble yourself. Uh, and unless you're working it out, he wasn't. Um, so I, I think this, the fact that he was so humble and kind made her, um, I don't know, I, she, more interested, of course, but probably 
very surprised, very shocked. Um, so Jesus is humbling himself. Uh, and that made her inter- uh, that made her interested in what he had to say. Um, and, and he offered her living water and explained what that was, even though he didn't have a rope or a bucket. He said, I've got living water. And, and now she's all ears. Now she wants to hear. Here's the thing. I think Christians often um, present the gospel in ways that are not attractive. Um, This may be the first time you've been under this, but it won't be the last. But if you get into a conversation, spiritual conversation with someone, you're talking to someone about Jesus, and it becomes an argument, stop. And, and, and don't say anything. Why? Because nobody who's ever argued is going to give you a job. And when it becomes an argument, you have just lost your opportunity. Talk to that person, not you. Don't be afraid to talk to them. I don't want to. Peter says in, in First or Second Peter that always be ready to give um, the reason for the hope that lies within you, but do it with gentleness and respect. And when we're gentle and when we're respectful, people listen. People want to listen to someone who is humble, to someone who is um, kind. Now, our actions often tell who we are and what we do better than us. And I believe people should know that you're a follower of Christ before you ever open your mouth. Um, It was St. Augustine who said this, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Our lives should look so much like Jesus that people can tell we're different. I am um, the woman who, who discipled me um, when I was a young believer, early years of believer. Um, and um, she was wonderful. Uh, she led the, the youth group that I became a part of after I became a believer. And um, she often, and probably still does, this this still does happen. Uh, she would be in a public place, and people would come up and say, "What are you talking about? There's something about you. What, what is it? What she tell them about Jesus." She was so filled with the Spirit and so filled with joy that people noticed. Uh, And and she didn't have to go to them. They came to her um, asking what was different. And I'm sorry if I've told you this before, but um, the Sunday or two Sundays after I trusted Christ, a woman came up to my mom and said, what's happened to Amy? She's completely different. And I was. I was a new creation tell. So um, it is how we approach people, not just what we say. It's how we live our lives. You have to have credibility. Uh, My friend Stan Parker once said to me, I know your dad must be a wonderful man. He didn't know my dad really well. He knew him some. He knew about him. And I said, well, how do you know that? And your sisters talk to him. Um, and he knew that my dad uh, was, was a humble, godly man uh, because he knew him. He was a humble, humble, godly man. Our lives should be a testimony of what Jesus has done in our lives. Um, and unbelievers will know this. Um, and and our words should um, lead others. Our actions and our words should lead others uh, to Christ. And then the next thing that he did for the woman is he made her face her need. He didn't just say, um, you know, give me a drink. He didn't just give have this theological conversation. He said, go get your husband. 
And he did that not to embarrass her. I think she probably was embarrassed. But she told the truth. That's six. But he wanted her to face her name. He wanted her to know that he and he wanted her to know that she knew. And and it, it worked. I mean, she did see it. Look, listen, unless you know you need Jesus, you'll never get it. You have to get to a point where you've come to the end of yourself and you realize you can't do it on your own. I have a member of my family. I'm not going to give you any sort of details because this goes out on YouTube. Um, and he's um, in his early 70s. Uh, and he has been um, an alcoholic and um, a pot smoker. That's what I mean, right? Uh, smoker since a year. And he'll tell you he can stop. Um, but he doesn't. Uh, and he has made a shambles of every relationship. And he wanted his family, his siblings, ex wives, his children. I don't see them. I don't have anything to do with them. Definitely not about their children. Why? Because he's a child. And because he doesn't know his, he thinks he's fine. He thinks everyone else is messed up, and he's fine. And he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand his need. And until that happens, nothing else in his life is going to change. Nothing else is going to be made right until he humbles himself and realizes and says, "Um." Silly example, but um, I, when I was in college, um, I found uh, I had a friend that gave me a recipe for cauliflower soup. And one of the things in the recipe said to um, cut an onion into very thin slices. Not much better now, not great, but better with a knife. But at that point, I was not good with a knife. Um, and I got, I don't know, two, maybe three big slices out of this, this onion. And I just couldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't slice it thinly. And so I looked up at my mom and I said, Mom, can you help me? Uh, and she, and she did it for me. We need to get to that place where we say, um, Already done. Yes, he's already died and risen to give us love. Um, my dad uh, used to work with Prison Fellowship, and the guy that was the head of Prison Fellowship in the state of Nebraska, he was an ex con himself. He came to Christ while in prison through Prison Fellowship. And I remember having lunch with my dad and him, and he said, It is easier. To convince a prisoner in jail, in prison, of their need of Christ than it is the average person. Is any of this? They know they need Christ. The average American has been since that's, that's a long time without Jesus. So we must help people see their need gently, respectfully see their need. Um, and then he, he made uh, her see her sin. Go call your husband. I had more than one husband, right? Uh, and, uh, and Jesus helped her see her sin gently, compassionately. Um, and, and she had to admit her sin and confess it to God. We all have to do that. Listen, the most compassionate, loving thing we can do for another person is to not let them continue in their sin. It is dangerous to let them in their sin because it will always be the first. It will always be the first. Um, and 
and sometimes the most compassionate thing we can do. It's loving chapter um, and, and help them see their sin. So here are some lessons for salvation. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give uh, him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Salvation is a gift. It's nothing we earn. Uh, nobody has ever opened a present from their parents or their grandparents and then turned and said, how much do I owe you for this? Well, then it ceases to be a gift if you're paying it back, paying back for it, right? It is a gift. It is free. Um, salvation brings everlasting life. He who drinks my water, Jesus said, will never thirst. Um, it brings uh, eternal life. And then salvation is for everyone. It's for everyone who will believe. Nobody is left out unless they choose to be left out. And then salvation is not related to race, wealth, intellect, uh, country, uh, any, anything, anyone can be saved. So we're going to end talking about um, how the, these two people in these two stories, uh, Demas and the woman at the well, how they were different. And this is going to be on your next test, too, so you want to make sure you write this down. Um, it might be in your book already, I don't know. And then how they were the same. So um, here's how they were, were uh, different. He was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. He was a man. He was a woman. He was rich. He was probably uh, he was a ruler, a Pharisee, an important man. She was a common woman, even an outcast. But uh, he was morally clean, not sinless, but he was keeping the law. And she was a woman of ill repute. She was a sinful woman. That's sometimes what she's referred to. If you're going to get yourself in the Bible, you don't want to be in there being called a sinful woman. Okay? Um, so, um, but then there's one way that they were both the same. Um, they both were sinners in need of a Savior. Both were loved by Jesus. And both came to faith in Christ as a result of Christ's grace. However different they were, they both needed Jesus. And, and he loved them both wealthy, important Nicodemus and the outcast sinful woman at the well. And, and they both were changed by Jesus' words. Okay.